Good evening, everyone. We can ask you all to find your seats. We'll get started. I'm Brian Amkrat, the Executive Director of the Elora and Alvin Siegel Lifelong Learning Program at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's lecture, uh, which is part of the broader Violins of Hope project, uh, which is currently in play here in Cleveland. Um, the Violins of Hope is really an unprecedented partnership <coughs> of a number of major cultural and educational institutions in town, uh, including Case Western Reserve University, the Cleveland Institute of Music, the Cleveland Orchestra, Basing History and Ourselves, Idea Stream, the Jewish Federation of Cleveland, and the Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage. So we thank all of them uh, for their collaboration on this project. Uh, I want to remind you of a couple of upcoming programs, some of which are related to Violins of Hope, uh, others part of uh, the other activities we have here in our lifelong learning program, uh, one of which includes a change of date um, for one of our lectures, uh, and that is uh, we are welcoming uh, back Professor Oded Zahavi, who is in residence at the Cleveland Institute of Music. Uh, he will be giving a lecture titled The Many Faces of Israeli Music. This is on Tuesday, November 17th. So many, some of you may have seen in the original Violins of Hope catalog that that was listed as the Monday, November 16th, but that is Tuesday the 17th. Uh, next week, uh, here on Monday evening, uh, we welcome Professor Sarah Horowitz uh, from York University who will speak on the Holocaust in Israeli cinema. Uh, and we have a class beginning in late November uh, here in, um, in our lifelong learning program uh, that we want to tell you about titled Spiritual Revolutionaries, Ideas of the Hasidic Masters uh, with, um, uh, with Rabbi Zach Truboff. So that begins here uh, at the end of November. One last announcement before uh, I introduce our speaker. And that is that the uh, gift shop of treasures is open and will be open after the talk tonight. So please uh, consider uh, doing some shopping there. Treasures is run by the Friends of Jewish Lifelong Learning, and we're grateful for their support, and we hope that you will support them. Uh, so on to our featured speaker for this evening. Uh, we're really fortunate to have with us James Young, who is Distinguished University Professor of English and Judaic Studies at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, where he has taught since 1988. He received his PhD from the University of California in 1983. His research and teaching areas include narrative theory, cultural memory studies, Holocaust studies, and visual culture. He is the author of Writing and Rewriting the Holocaust, The Texture of Memory, which won the National Jewish Book Award in 1994, and At Memory's Edge, after images of the Holocaust in contemporary art and architecture. In 1997, he was appointed by the Berlin Senate to the five-member Findungskommission for Germany's National Memorial to Europe's Murdered Jews, which selected Peter Eisenman's design. In 2003, he was appointed by the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation to the jury for the World Trade Center Site Memorial competition, which was won by Michael Arad and Peter Walker. He continues to serve on the Academic Advisory Board of the National 9-11 Memorial Museum in New York City. In 2000, he was appointed Editor-in-Chief of the Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization, which is a 10-volume anthology of primary sources, documents, texts, and images through Yale University Press. At present, he is completing an insider story of the World Trade Center Memorial entitled The Stages of Memory at Ground Zero, a juror's report on the World Trade Center site memorial. Tonight, he will be speaking on the language of memorial architecture between Berlin and New York. Please join me in welcoming Professor James Young. Thanks so much for having me. <clears throat> it's great to see some old friends here and uh, met some new friends today as well. Um, <clears throat> I thought I'd start <clears throat> by reflecting for a moment on uh, what happened the moment we announced the winning design, Michael, uh, Michael Arad and Peter Walker's winning design for the 9-11 Memorial at Ground Zero in New York City. <clears throat> um, we worked on this as a jury for about a year 
Uh, we viewed in nine months 5,201 designs from 62 countries around the world and uh, narrowed it down finally to three <clears throat> and then one winning design, uh, which we announced in January 2004. Uh, Michael Arad and Peter Walker's design is called Reflecting Absence, <clears throat> and it's composed of two gigantic voids built into the footprints, waterfalls coming down the edges with two further voids at their very centers. Um, they're gigantic because the buildings were gigantic. <clears throat> they're 200 feet square, about an acre each, and, um, and quite powerful, and in the end, I think it's, um, it's, it's a great memorial. Um, but everything that was happening in New York those days was completely fraught, as you probably remember. And so the first question I had <clears throat> on announcing this design uh, to everybody uh, was, um, and this was after being sequestered for nine months, we weren't allowed to talk to the press uh, during, our, during our, our deliberations. And the reporter said, so <clears throat> let's see, you've uh, we're on the jury in Berlin that chose the Peter Eisenman design for the Denkmal. And we know that Maya Lin was on your jury uh, here for the 9-11 memorial. <clears throat> and uh, we know that you've worked with uh, Daniel Liebeskent on his Jewish museum and design and have written quite a bit about it. And of course, uh, you've written at length about something called counter monuments, you know, negative four monuments, <clears throat> monuments built into the ground. Is, haven't you just really chosen just another Holocaust monument for 9-11? And you know, at first I was a little taken aback and a little bit offended, but as I began to formulate my answer, <clears throat> I had to agree that in some ways, reflecting absence did owe a debt, <clears throat> not just to Holocaust memorials, but to a whole generation of negative four memorials, memorials preoccupied by absence and by, um, you know, by voids, uh, by things that can't be replaced, by things that can't be compensated. And um, I began to go back and I, and I realized that, in fact, I had met Maya Lin for the first time in 1987 when we were both giving talks at uh, the Harvard School of Design on memorials. This in the midst of Boston's own Holocaust Memorial Project. And, um, uh, she had told me at dinner, and this is how I, I remember it anyway, uh, she, she remembers it a little bit differently. I talked to her about it uh, while we were on the jury. <clears throat> but she said that her Vietnam Veterans Memorial, in fact, owed a debt to two European memorials, one being Edwin Lutens's memorial at the Battle of the Somme, to the fallen of the Battle of the Somme in France, and the other being this memorial here in Paris on the Ile de Cité. <clears throat> Maya had spent her junior year abroad <clears throat> uh, from Yale in Paris. And um, <clears throat> she said that she, was, she would sit in this memorial designed in 1957, finally dedicated, I think, in 1960, 61, by Henri Pangouchon. And what was striking about this memorial for her was obviously its, its form up above is horizontal. It's got um, kind of triangle themes throughout, uh, really denoting the triangles that the uh, prisoners of concentration camps uh, had to wear. Um, this particular triangle resonates more of a political, a political prisoner triangle and kind of its red roses. <clears throat> to get down into it, you have to descend down a very narrow stairway. <clears throat> and as you descend, the rest of the city kind of disappears. Um, it's right. Uh, it's, it's right next to um, the great uh, Notre Dame uh, Cathedral. You can see the spire coming up right here. And what she was struck by is that this was a place carved out of the earth into which you descended, blocking the rest of the, the, rest of the world out. Um, kind of a stylized uh, barbed wire, again with the triangles here, above a tiny little window you see looking out onto the River Seine concentration camps emblazoned <clears throat> on these black marble triangles. And to see the only place you can look out, your only kind of respite from this kind of oppressive space is to look out of this grilled window out to the River Seine. If you go out across the bridge and across the river and look at this from across the river, you see like kind of a, a prow of a ship. It's a big jutting elbow going into the River Seine. 
from inside, you're inside this elbow. And what really struck me once I saw Maya Lin's design here is that <clears throat> she's taken um, a traditional military uh, kind of aggre very aggressive form, the, the jutting elbow, the spear, the arrow, the point of a sword. And instead of doing this, she did this. She created the crook of an arm into which we now fall into its embrace. So she counterpointed the very traditional military form in remembering the fallen vets of the Vietnam, the fallen soldiers of the Vietnam War. Instead of this, she did this. She opened a space in the landscape which would open a space within us for memory. And it's a beautiful formulation that the jury took a long time to try to figure out, the jury that chose this. They couldn't, they couldn't get it at first. It passed through several stages and it kept getting forwarded to the next stage by what is called a passion vote. One of the jurors did get it in that competition. Remember, it was an open blind competition with over a thousand submissions you know, from around the world. She wanted a form <clears throat> that in fact would not be a wall. She described it as taking a knife in the earth and opening the earth up like that. She wanted to create a wound in the earth. Just as America had been wounded by the war, American memory wounded by the war, the soldiers wounded by their experiences, and in fact, um, the, the reception that the vets had when they came home was also very wounding as a whole nationally. <clears throat> they received very badly. Uh, the memory of the war was tortured, as most of you remember. It was a war that Americans preferred almost to forget, but of course the veterans didn't forget. They remembered their experiences. They remember what they fought for. But to come home now, having fought a war that the nation now abhorred, you know, created a kind of an impossible situation. How do you remember a war that you'd rather forget nationally on the National Mall like this? She integrated her design by taking one, one axis is pointing toward the Washington Monument, the other axis points toward the Lincoln Memorial, thereby you know, linking everything right there on the wall. There are no figures <clears throat> in this. The only figures are we ourselves who now look in and see our own reflections. The memorial becomes a little bit about us. It's a place for us to come and contemplate, not, not an object against which we push back or pushes us back or, or actually defeats us in its monumentality, but presents us only with humanly sized uh, humanly proportioned figures are in the shape of our own reflections staring back at us. The names are arranged on this wall, not alphabetically, but historically in the order in which the soldiers fell during the war, so that uh, everybody can find exactly where their, their, their brother, their son, <coughs> their father may have fallen during the war by, by, no, by, by relocating this name historically in the order in which they fell. You know all the objects that are left there. <clears throat> They've now collected all these objects, people leaving mementos of their own visits. And in fact, she counterpointed almost every single very traditional memorial form in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, she took this black negative four monument a, what was then called <clears throat> unsympathetically a black ash, but is meant to be a wound, and put it in a, a city dominated by white, neoclassical obelisks and columns, <clears throat> and thereby counterpointed all of Washington's very traditional memorial statuary. And she did it quite deliberately in order to articulate the great ambivalence Americans felt about remembering the fallen of the Vietnam War a war that they now abhorred. So I've got this kind of running around on my mind, and she was also fresh on my mind because of all the time we've just spent together now for the 9-11 the memorial. And so I finally kind of came up with an answer <clears throat> that um, I've spent now the last several years trying to backfill <clears throat> and trying to tell the, you know, the story of the arc um, from, say, the Vietnam Veterans War Memorial through Berlin all the way back to the 9-11 uh, Memorial in New York City. And my answer was that, no, this isn't a Holocaust Memorial per se, but all of Memorial art, all of architecture, I would say, post-World War II, 
I would say much of lit literature and poetry, um, I would say philosophy, even some music, all have been inflected by memory of the Holocaust, <clears throat> by the breach in civilization that these events have come to represent. Events that can't be compensated, they can't be fixed, they can't be redeemed, they can't be repaired, they can't be filled in, it can't be made good again. Um, and how to articulate that unfilled void in a form that doesn't fill it in became kind of the preoccupation for a whole generation of memorial artists and, uh, and architects after World War II. What this also did <clears throat> was clearly um, inspire uh, a whole generation of German artists faced with their own problem, memorial problem. How in Germany do you commemorate the Holocaust? How do you remember a national crime in the national name? Um, how do you possibly uh, rebuild or, or, or reunite uh, divided Berlin on the bedrock memory of the Nazi crimes? You know, nobody had ever done this before. Um, nobody had ever attempted it before. And when they asked me early on to come advise them on how to go forward, I said, you're, you're doing something that nobody's done before. Where in Washington, D.C. is there even one little pebble on the National Mall to commemorate the slave auctions that were held there for 60 years, right within view of the White House and, and the Capitol building? Not even a pebble to commemorate slave auctions held on our National Mall. Nations don't build their memorial cultures, their memorial legacies on the memory of crimes perpetrated in the national name. We build our memorial legacies on the, on the memory of our, our martyrdom, <clears throat> our own deaths, our victories, our triumphs, but never on the memory of crimes perpetrated in our name. No national memorial to slavery in, in Washington, D.C. And I said you're trying to do something by building a dank mall to the mur murder Jews of Europe in, in the center of Berlin that's never been, you know, never been conceived of by anybody else before. So in the very first competition for that memorial <clears throat> in 1995, an artist, Horst Hoheisel, proposed taking the Brandenburger Tor, the Nash, Germany's national monument, and blowing it up, <clears throat> covering over the whole area with plates, <clears throat> and here would now be the memorial. You become the memorial for which you search. How better to remember a destroyed people than by destroying the national monument? That was Ho Hoheisel's point. He also knew this would probably never be done, and that was also part of his point. He wasn't, he wasn't sure that such a memorial should even be completed. Better perhaps to have an unresolved memorial debate, ongoing discussion and arguments you know, uh, in perpetuity than to fix the memory of a national crime like this in one time and place. And he said here in his, his little statement, which is kind of hard to read here, there will be two voids where once there was the national memorial. In another, and this, this he proposed in 1995. In 1986, uh, Jochen Geertz, a German artist, and Esther Shalev Geertz, an Israeli artist uh, who was actually born in Vilna and immigrated to Israel when she was eight years old, um, <clears throat> joined up to propose this memorial um, against war and for peace, um, a generic Holocaust memorial in Harburg. Uh, actually, it was intended to be in Hamburg near the Dom Tor and the beautiful uh, uh, gardens there. But they want to relocate it out to an immigrant center in a little you know, kind of a, a dingy um, uh, suburb across the river. So uh, heart to Harburg it went. And they proposed taking a 12 meter lead, lead covered tall column and then inviting the citizens of Harburg <clears throat> and visitors to town to add their names here to ours. In doing so, we commit ourselves to remain vigilant as more and more names cover this 12 meter tall lead column, it will gradually be lowered into the ground. One day it will have disappeared completely. And the site of the Harburg Monument against fascism will be empty. In the end, it is only we ourselves who can rise up against injustice. So here we are, 1986, <clears throat> just five, four years after Maya Lin's monument was dedicated to the Vietnam veterans. Um, a generation of artists is now proposing a Holocaust memorial that disappears, it goes into the ground, creating space for those of us who come to visit it. It doesn't take our place. And in fact, the worst thing a memorial can do is take our place. In the end, it is only we ourselves who can rise up against injustice, not the memorials. These memorials don't rise up against injustice. We rise up against injustice. So. 
this memorial basically returns the burden of memory to those who come looking for it. And sure enough, the local citizens came out and began inscribing their names in nice, neat little rows. But before too long, it was covered with all kinds of scribble, scrabble, graffiti, swastikas began to appear. Uh, the mayor was very upset. We've got to get rid of this. It's, it's, it's become a trap for graffiti and filth. And the artist just said simply, well, doesn't every memorial just basically reflect back to the community its own preoccupations? Isn't the swastika also a kind of a signature, after all? And there was no denying that was true. And the garrison simply said, look at the faster you fill this up, the faster you're going to get rid of it. You know, this is, this is how, you know, how do you want to, how do you remember something you'd like to forget? By making it disappear, by making a disappearing memorial. And sure enough, between 1986 and 1993, in its last sinking, it began to disappear. Thereby, actually countering all kinds of con conventional memorial um, you know, premises. Instead of remaining uh, in perpetuity and everlasting and unviolated, it, it invited its own violation. It would move, it was animated, it would go away. Um, at one point, <clears throat> um, somebody said, well, proposed to Jochen, Ger Jochen and Esther, um, well, maybe after it disappears, maybe with the rise of xenophobia in Germany, it should start coming back up again like a barometer. And then when it disappears, it would go back down. And they, they contemplated that. They liked that idea. And in the end, it's gone, <clears throat> sunk finally in 1993. Um, thereby creating a space for the visitors who come to remember. And that, that was their point. This now becomes like a, a pedestal for you, for those who come to remember. And it cannot be a substitute for the action by visitors who come to remember and then act on this memory of the victims of fascism. A few years later, Jochen Geertz took a, a position at Saarbrücken, uh, <coughs> kind of the uh, Fine Arts uh, uh, Institute. And he had a class on building monuments in which he invited half the class to go out and steal cobblestones from the rest of the city, take them back to this big courtyard, this big schloss where the Gestapo had been headquartered during the war, and uh, where the other half of the class will have taken these cobblestones out and taken them back to the classroom and engraved the names of every single Jewish cemetery destroyed by the Nazis in Germany between 1933 and 1945, some 2,162 cemeteries. They inscribed the names of these cemeteries on the stones. They took them back out and planted them back in this big, this big plaza. But of course, Jochen Geertz is running this, so they installed these stones inscribed side down <clears throat> so that there's no trace of the entire operation. So when they announced this, uh, people came down to the square to see, to see it for themselves. And they said, well, where's the memorial? And all the students answered probably a little bit too, uh, a little bit too self-satisfied. Look within yourselves for the memory that you've come to find here. Only you can remember. Horst Hoheisel, who proposed blowing up the Brandenburger Tor, in 1986, while the Geertzes are designing this disappearing memorial in Harburg, uh, Horst is winning a competition for a memorial in Kassel, uh, a memorial that was supposed to commemorate the fountain uh, donated to the town of Kassel um, by Zygmunt Aschrot, a local Jewish uh, philanthropist, but which was destroyed in 1938 by the Nazis uh, because it was uh, they called it the Jew's Fountain. Um, but instead of replacing the fountain, Hoheisel took its original shape and, and size and inverted it <clears throat> into the ground. So again, the Geertzes and, and Horst both said that of course they never would have thought of this kind of thing without Maya Lin's monument built into the ground, you know, the, the wound in the ground, the negative form, the negative space. And so this was built. And water, instead of coming out of this neoclassic, uh, neo-Gothic uh, fountain, would now fill up in this little channel and spill back down into the space. So as you stand on top of this glass space and look down, you can see the reflection of the space. So it's almost like the phantom of the fountain that it once been, but now you look down to see it. 
and uh, Ho Heisel's language was almost identical to the Gertz's, completely uncoordinated though. He said, I didn't want to build another object in, in the space. I wanted to build a pedestal onto which the visitors would step and become the memorial for which they search. So it's, it's in their brain, you know, somehow. And uh, in, a, in a strange way, May, Maya Lin may have, may have put it there. So, Jochen Gertz and Esther <coughs> Shalev met in Israel in 1982 at an exhibition, um, an outdoor exhibition <coughs> of memorials to counterpoint the National Memorial at Tel Chai, um, a memorial uh, remembering Joseph Trumpeldor, who was, was uh, killed by um, Arab, uh, uh, Arab gunmen in, I think it was 1923. Um, <clears throat> this was a time of great unsettling in Israel. It was a time, uh, actually, uh, during and just um, uh, just after 1983, the Lebanon War, and these artists were invited to counterpoint and contain the national monument at Tel Chai. And uh, one of the artists, uh, Esther Gertz, created a form in Jerusalem stone in which she carved out a figure, so the figure is now absent and only the stone remains around the figure. Another artist, Micha Ullman, an Israeli artist, um, built a trench in the ground near Tel Chai. He said that he wanted people to go down into the trench and look out so that you could only see, he, he wanted you to see as if you were looking from the grave, um, he wanted you to see the, the jagged edge of sky as outlined by the edge of this trench. So he's already thinking of how to dig holes and how to dig uh, these negative forms. And again, this is right around the Vietnam uh, Veterans uh, Memorial competition and, and the results. So it's, it's in everybody's brain at this point. Michal Ullmann subsequently won the competition in Berlin for a memorial at the Babelplatz to commemorate the book burnings that took place there in 1933 and 34, not long after the, uh, the Nazis took power. And um, in Michael Ullmann's design, uh, he called it bibliotech. <clears throat> um, right in the middle here, you can see a, a window into which you look. The two steel tablets on either side, one tells the uh, story of the book burnings, and the other uh, tablet just quotes Heinrich Heine, uh, the great German-Jewish poet, who wrote once that uh, where books are burned, so too one day will people be burned as well. The only vertical forms uh, standing in this plaza are not monuments, but they're people who come to look down into the window, and this is what they see. They see a, an empty room. They see an empty room of bookshelves without books. Uh, the books can't be replaced, just as the people who wrote them cannot be replaced. An absence is now being remembered by an absence. Um, it can never be filled up. And this, this theme of the book and this theme of the void and emptiness, again, reverberating here uh, for Michael Ullmann uh, as well. But this theme of the void and the breach, <clears throat> um, the things that can't be filled in, were already on his mind. They were on his mind in Israel in 1982. Um, they were on Maya Lin's mind you know, in 1981, you know, when she came back from Paris with this idea to cut a wound into the earth and open it up and to open that space up within us. Rachel Whiteread, uh, also a, a great uh, a British uh, sculptor, um, who won the Turner Prize in 1984 for filling in a row house <coughs> uh, in London, which was going to be torn down, filling it in with concrete and then pulling all the walls away, all the staircases away, um, <clears throat> to leave only the, the empty spaces now articulated by concrete. <clears throat> Her aim, she says, is to find a way to make materiality an index of absence. How to show absence without filling it in somehow. So she proposed for the, v the Vienna uh, Holocaust Memorial to Austria's murder Jews, located on the Judenplatz, to <clears throat> fill in the space between a library and all the books, between the book leaves and the wall. So say the books are pushed right up against a wall lined up on the shelves. It's just that little space between. 
And by articulating that now in this poured concrete, um, she would identify the spaces between the books and the wall and show that somehow, called bibliotheque. Um, huge arguments ensued whether or not to go ahead building it. They began excavating, and of course, they found the ruins of a synagogue which had been uh, burned on that site in 1523, uh, a local pogrom, auto da fe, where the townspeople rounded all the Jews in that neighborhood up, put them in their synagogue, and burned them alive on that site. And um, <clears throat> when they found those ruins, um, uh, the townspeople said, maybe we should allow that to be the Holocaust Memorial too. And Rachel White Reed answered them as well, um, if you leave that only, then you have to uh, go for information to the church right next door where there is a, a, a tapestry, a beautiful tapestry with, with an inscription in Latin. Um, the flames of hatred rose against the Hebrew dogs in 1523 to punish them for their terrible crimes. That was how the murdered Jews were being remembered in the church next door. So, okay, we'll go ahead and build a memorial, in fact. And so this is now Austria's, you know, kind of their, their national memorial uh, to Austria's murdered Jews. Shimon Ati, the American artist, uh, born in LA, practiced as a therapist in San Francisco, moved to Berlin in 1991, just after the wall came down, not knowing exactly what he was going to do, but he was struck by what he didn't see, the absent doorways, the doorways with the mezuzah missing, um, no reference to the Jews that had once lived in this neighborhood in the Schoenenviertel, the, uh, the barn district in, the, in, in Mitte, uh, kind of just, just on the East German side um, of Berlin. So he went and found hundreds of archival photographs of Jews in this, in this neighborhood, made slides out of these photographs, and then at night, without telling anybody, projected them back onto their original sites all around Berlin in order to reanimate these otherwise completely amnesiac buildings. By themselves, the buildings remember nothing. They remember only what you project back onto them. So that's what he did here. A Hebrew bookseller projected back onto the original doorway. Another Jewish you know, Hebrew bookstore here. And the, the, the effect is kind of uncanny <clears throat> because it's almost as if the facade were peeling away to remember what had once been here on that, on that site. But uh, for Shimon, uh, it was very simple. Um, he didn't have direct memory of what was here. His memory is informed by the research he did. And now he's got to kind of reanimate these buildings with what happened here so that when people would see this and then he would turn the projection off, it would stay in their mind's eye. It would live on within them. It would no longer be on the building, but they would never, he hoped, be able to look at the building again without seeing the projection of the Jews who had once lived in that neighborhood. So the 1995 competition for National Memorial to uh, Murder Jews of Europe uh, was voided in 1997, uh, actually voided in 1995 by Helmut Kohl. It was a bad design and um, they didn't know what to do, which way to turn. And so they held a series of symposia 1997, to which I was invited to kind of give a closing keynote um, to kind of plumb the depths of Germany's national memorial problem. And as I had said before uh, in my discussions with them, I, I said that you really do have a, a conundrum um, and that you're trying to solve, and nobody else has ever done this before. Um, you know, how to remember a people murdered in your name how to reunite on the bedrock memory of a national crime. Um, maybe it's better <clears throat> if you understand how all these other nations have gone about remembering and, and how their discussions have been about their own specific problems. So I told the stories of Yad Vashem and Yom HaShoah in Israel, the Holocaust Museum in, in Washington, and uh, museum and memorial controversies in Poland. And it kind of set, set their minds at ease a little bit. <clears throat> this is Germany's problem, and it's the hardest one to solve. And uh, so I said, uh, maybe it's better than, in fact, that you um, uh, don't build a memorial. Maybe you should just have a, a memorial competition every single year for a thousand years. Maybe there is no final solution to your Holocaust memorial problem, I said. 
And uh, they got it immediately and um, were somewhat relieved. But then the moment I got home, uh, two days later, uh, the, the, uh, Peter Radunsky, the, the head of the Berlin Senate, Senate, called to see if I would now be on a Findungskommission, a new jury, for a new Holocaust memorial competition. And I said, well, you know, I don't think it can really be done. And so precisely because you don't think it can be done, we want you to do it with us. I go, well, as long as we propose the possibility that there is no perfect design, and as long as you hold open the possibility that we arrive at nothing, then I can, I can participate. Rather than looking for like the answer, let's look for an articulation of the question that, that we have here. So that's how we left it. And uh, in fact, the competition was held. We were allowed to invite 25 artists and architects <clears throat> from around the world. Uh, 19 ended up taking our invitation. We ended up with three finalists, including this design by Daniel Liebeskind. Um, this is really kind of an articulation of the six voids that he built into the Jewish Museum, uh, located just a couple miles away. Um, we liked the way he allowed the plaza to run over into the Tiergarten, uh, pointing right to the Goethe uh, bust there uh, in that kind of third row of trees, uh, the Tiergarten. Um, but that was our number three pick. The number two was this proposal by Gesine Weinmiller, a young uh, German architect, a woman, uh, that I liked best of all. Um, first of all, I liked that it would be a young German woman designing this and not yet another um, old American man. <clears throat> I wanted the Germans to kind of step up and take this for themselves. Um, but the other jurors were all German and that made them a little bit uncomfortable. Um, just like my own role was in some ways, you know, a little bit of a political ornament, uh, that some people thought at the time. But I liked that she took 18 segments of uh, limestone wall akin to the uh, stones of the Kotel uh, in Jerusalem, the, the, the Western Wall, arranged them in seemingly random patterns, which though, as you walked along this parapet and went to that far right-hand corner, you would look in and suddenly these otherwise random uh, segments would now compose themselves into a Jewish star. And as you walked away, it would fall apart. And she didn't tell us this, but we found it on our own. But then we worried that it was a little bit gimmicky. We didn't know, we didn't want like an aha moment, you know, for everybody who came here. But we liked that she had, in fact, uh, built this into the space. It was a negative form. You had to descend into it. The Berlin would disappear uh, along the edges as you went into it. Clearly uh, a debt to Myelin. And this isn't to say that anybody's quoting Myelin any more than Myelin was quoting anybody else. But this design is clearly inflected by Myelin's preoccupation with, um, you know, with that negative space built into the landscape. We ended up choosing this design by Peter Eisenman and Richard Serra, 4,200 Stelle over this five acre uh, site, ranging from ground level to as high as 28 or 29 feet high. Um, we thought it was actually physically too dangerous to build as it was. Uh, we had the we had the picture of kids running out over the tops and falling between and breaking their necks or worse, and uh, so we talked to the artist and the uh, and the, the architect and asked them if they could modify it. <clears throat> Eisenman was happy to modify it and did, um, but uh, Sarah said, "I'm a sculptor. <clears throat> the logic of my of my work is an implicit danger." And we go, we don't mind the implicit danger. We just don't want actual danger. And Eisenman said, it's okay, I'll just, I'll reduce everything. But he did that without consulting with Sarah, who then left the project. Because he said, if you change the scale, then it's no longer mine. You know, he, he builds these gigantic Corten steel ellipses. And they're, they're beautiful. You know, but um, they, they are dangerous. And you feel very small and threatened by them as they seem to be teetering above. And there are cases in which workmen installing these have been killed when they topple over on top of them. And we knew all that. So some people propose, of course, just leaving the space open. This is a, a picture of the site <clears throat> uh, when the wall was still standing, as before 1989. 
And uh, this was kind of a no man's land here. Uh, minefields, barbed wire, guards, uh, you know, the Brandenburger Tor just on the east side of the wall. And if you look right at the very tip top of the East German flag, that's where Hitler's bunker actually is, was. Um, no reference to it, although now there is a reference to it if you visit. <clears throat> but in the old days, there used to be no reference to it because they didn't want that to become a shrine for neo-Nazis to come and create, you know, um, celebratory and victorious memorials in honor of the man who actually um, wiped out European Jewry. Uh, that was their victory, and they knew that. Eisenman scaled it down to uh, about 2,711 Stelle out of the total of 4,200. He put trees around, uh, made it much gentler, but here you see it's a rolling field of Stelle instead of fixed cemetery, you know, matsevot or, or uh, tombstones in kind of military precision. This one is moving, it's animated. He wanted to un unlock that form and make it a moving animated one, almost like a waving field of wheat or grass. And sure enough, it was chosen. Uh, we, we recommended it and we recommended it in three stages. Uh, we asked the Bundestag to vote up or down. Do you want a memorial to Europe's murdered Jews in the center of Berlin. Do you want the Eisenman design, which we are recommending to you after the competition? And do you want a place of information built underneath? And they voted all of these up, and by in May 2005, uh, it was dedicated <clears throat> and finished. Um, a little bit of a sidebar, uh, it became a political football, in fact, in Berlin during the 1998-99 elections. And in 99, in fact, um, 98, in fact, during the elections, uh, Joschka Fischer, uh, head of the Green Party, was invited to join a red-green coalition uh, by Gerhard Schroeder, uh, who had kind of won uh, uh, about 30% of, um, uh, of the vote. He wanted to put together a red-green coalition. Uh, Schroeder did not want this memorial and wanted to uh, void the whole thing and start over again. Joschka Fischer said, I will join your coalition, but only on condition that the memorial be built. So they went ahead and built the memorial. Uh, no, they went ahead and admitted him into the coalition. They went and built the memorial. And while it was being built, of course, Germany was now invited by NATO <clears throat> to begin flying sorties over Serbia and Belgrade in order to stop the certain genocide of Kosovar Albanians um, unfolding before, every, before the world's eyes. And Joschka Fischer simply announced that the memorial is not enough unless we act on the memory that we have now placed in the center of Berlin to stop another unfolding genocide before our eyes. That memorial is hollow. And so he agreed. And they changed a, a German law uh, that was actually built into the Constitution, amended it in order for Germ the German Air Force to participate in the bombing, NATO bombing, of the Serbs, which in fact stopped that certain genocide in 1999. So there is, uh, there, are, there are very, very specific policy um, implications here. So the memorial uh, does work. It's not perfect. Um, it's widely visited. Millions of visitors a year come to it. Um, it's got the problems of any big public space <clears throat> and that all kinds of things happen here, even things that you don't want to happen here. Uh, the parliament was very concerned and asked us what they should do about it, and we said nothing. It's going to be a public space. You can't put barbed wire up around it. You can't put guards to keep people out. <clears throat> um, it sits within the site of the Reichstag and within the site of the Brandenburger Tor. But what we especially like, and what now kind of begins to you know, take us toward New York, is that they did build this place of information underneath because the memorial itself is 100% abstract. You know, there's this little sign as you come in that says this is you know, the Denkmal for you know, Europe's murdered Jews. But what in this formal design suggests that? Really to understand what is commemorating, um, you have to go down into the information center below where in four rooms, the story of you know, the mass murder of Europe's Jews is told. And it's done very, very simply, but very efficiently, very directly, and, and very effectively. And they've even allowed the sense of the stele to come into the space. So
so they've created kind of a, um, an interpenetrating space of yin yang. This abstract design above is now anchored in very hard historical narrative below, and the hard historical narrative below is now shaped by the, the Stelle, which seem now to dip into it. It's a wonderful design. Uh, Dagmar von Wilken uh, uh, came up with this in, in her design of, the, of this museum space. Um, and we had that in the backs of our minds in New York City, where eventually the Michael Arad design lost all of its galleries and things underneath. And now there's the National 9-11 Memorial Museum built underneath this very abstract design above. So you have the, the story of the day holding up or supporting the memory of it in abstract design above. And of course, the kids do run out over the tops, just as we knew they would. So we're going to make this leap now to New York. <clears throat> so I've been writing about these things in um, uh, three different books now, uh, the last published in, in 2000. Uh, in which I tell the story of the Berlin Memorial um, and how it came into being and our deliberations and the politics around it. And uh, I had lived in New York City for 24 years at one stretch, <clears throat> uh, moving up to Amherst, Mass to, uh, to rear kids. Um, but within three weeks of the attacks, uh, I was getting phone calls now from both the mayor's office and the governor's office to come down <clears throat> and um, to work with them on figuring out how to memorialize 9-11. And I just said, it's, it's not a memory yet. <clears throat> it's ongoing. We don't know what it means. The only people who have an absolute lock on the meaning are the families who lost people in the buildings and on the planes in Washington and in, uh, in Pennsylvania. And I said, instead of thinking about the fixed memorial, you, you need to think of the memorial to 9-11, whatever that's going to be, in its long durée. It began the moment those images were beamed around the world, and 1.4 billion people around the world watched the towers come down. They watched on live TV as the towers came down. It seemed to happen to everybody in the world. People took it personally, reflected in the faces of those who were watching the towers come down, almost harder to bear than watching the towers themselves. You think of the memorial as beginning in these moments, being remembered, being transmitted, trying, people try to make sense of it. Maybe the memorial has to start with the very first candlelight vigils the evening of September 11th here in Union Square, you know, 14th Street. Washington Square had similar vigils, vigils on the Brooklyn Promenade. You know, this is your memorial and you don't have to do anything about it. Don't do anything. The memorial is now playing out in its long durée. Think of the memorial as stages of memory. In these candlelight vigils, the candles being a very traditional memorial response, obviously, um, you know, trying to beat back the darkness, <clears throat> uh, the kind of the ephemerality of the flickering flame, you know, reminding people of the ephemerality of life itself consoling sense of the warmth they bring, the animated flame, recalling the lives, lives lost. And I said, there are memorials on the streets right now, and you didn't have to make them. The thousands and thousands of flyers that the families began posting within days, within hours of the attacks, you know, have you seen my mother? Have you seen my father? And the memorial motif is already now established, missing, absent, didn't come home. You know, and I, I told them, this, this is your memorial. It's being documented. It's being played out. And everybody knows this. And you know, these are almost like ephemeral um, uh, epitaphs on a tombstone. We have the description. We have a full name, also known as any information where they were living, where they were working, what their children's names and spouses' names are in all of these, all of these flyers everywhere. What was missing for most, unfortunately, for better or worse, were the towers. 
Um, most people didn't know people in the towers or on the planes. And so there was a conflation in a way of memory for the towers and memory for the lives lost. And it wasn't clear. They were kind of, they were kind of jumbled up and confused, I think, for the first uh, several, several months even uh, afterwards. Uh, I know it was striking to suddenly get out of a subway and not have the towers kind of orient you. The firefighters knew exactly what they had lost and why it was clear. And it was also very clear very early on that they were probably going to have to be remembered differently from those who found themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time. These were firefighters who raced down. They often walked the last two or three miles themselves with you know, 100 pounds of equipment on their backs to go up 80 floors to save people. They, did, they weren't in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's what they do. That's what they did. And the culture of the firefighters' families um, made very clear that they would have to be remembered as such. And uh, in fact, we found a way to, uh, to do that without, we hope, creating a hierarchy of victims. It wasn't to privilege first responders over those you know, lost um, you know, in, their, in their daily jobs, but it was to distinguish between personal loss and civic loss. The firefighters' families experienced personal loss, but also civic loss, and the city experienced the civic loss as well. Lots of people thought, well, maybe you just want to freeze everything. Just freeze the destruction where it is. Freeze that and clear everything up, and that will be the memorial. And of course, the, the answer is quite simple. To remember this destruction in, 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 the term, in terms of the destruction itself would basically be to remember these events as the bombers left them with us. This would be the, this would be the terrorist memorial to 9-11, and it wouldn't be a memorial to uh, you know, to catastrophe, it would be a victory memorial for them. The firefighters uh, also liked this very much, kind of the accidental cross. Um, in fact, that was uh, salvaged and is now being moved from St. Paul's uh, nearby to the periphery of the 9-11 uh, site, the World Trade Center site. The six-month anniversary was tribute in light to, you know, light beams which in fact originally had been conceived to celebrate the 30th birthday of the World Trade Center Towers just two years before, and now they were being used to commemorate the destroyed towers. They were first called um, <clears throat> uh, Towers of Light, and they changed the name when the families objected and said, what about the victims? So they changed it to Tribute in Light to the victims. The first anniversary, uh, again, I was asked to, to come and observe and, and help them kind of think about what was going on in that first anniversary when the victims' families would read their lost loved ones' names and then take a, a, a flower, a rose in this case, to two symbolic um, uh, pools, you know, square pools, now right at ground zero. Within one year, the entire site had been cleaned. And so I, I took these pictures um, of the family members, kind of participating with them. You see the slurry walls here, which were also being preserved, and which are now preserved also within the museum itself. Uh, these families have come back uh, every single year, and the, the commemoration ceremony is exactly the same. <clears throat> Bringing flowers, laying them in these, in these reflecting ponds. So this was already kind of going on, uh, and it, it didn't end up suggesting the form that the memorial, the winning memorial finally took, <clears throat> but all of this is in the um, kind of the, the spirit of the, of the day and of the moment, year after year. They wondered, what do you do first? Do you build a memorial or do you rebuild the World Trade Center site towers? And they couldn't figure it out, and the answer was pretty simple. It doesn't matter which comes first. Whatever you do first will be followed by the other. They went ahead with a, a, a site design competition. Uh, second place was by Frederick Schwartz and Raphael Vignoli, the so-called Think Team, which proposed these two skeletal towers, which critics and architects liked, but which the families hated because it reminded them of death. Uh, offices would only go up about halfway, up about 60 stories, but the rest would go all the way to the, um, uh, you know, like the 110 stories of the original towers. 
Governor Pataki um, decided to make an executive decision and just came down hard on the side not of these. <clears throat> this void, by the way, was part of this, of this design. The architects were not asked to create a memorial, but they, just, they couldn't stop themselves. So they articulate the footprints in this way, a, a big empty cube. Pataki instead chose Daniel Liebeskind's design, then called Vertical World Gardens. You can see the asymmetrical spire here, which should be filled with hanging gardens, um, built to 1,776 feet high. And of course, meant in its asymmetry to echo the Lady Liberty's torch. The families loved this, Pataki loved it, so he just chose it. <clears throat> that I hereby choose the Liebeskind design. Announced it, uh, a lot of disgruntled critics and things in New York, but um, the families were happy. And at that point, the governor felt that he owed this to the families and not to the critics. This came up again, of course, during our deliberations when we asked him uh, very directly not to overrule us, whatever it is we picked, and he agreed to. Not, he agreed not to overrule us. Liebeskin left within this space um, <clears throat> the entire open five acre or six, six acre uh, open section within the, the slurry walls here, was called the bathtub. But he did encumber parts of the footprints, as you see here. Um, this square right here is the north footprint. And then this building he, he put uh, is the, what he called the cultural center, um, uh, cantilevered right over the top of it. <clears throat> and it was something that came up uh, a few days uh, after our jury was announced. In April 2003, uh, the jury was announced here at the World Financial Center. It was called the Winter Garden. Uh, Paula Grant Barry is, is seen speaking here. Uh, the only family member, uh, she lost her husband David, uh, as did her, their three children, lost their father. Uh, he was in the South Tower when it was hit. Other jurors include Vartan Gregorian, <coughs> uh, Lowry Sims of the Harlem Studio uh, Museum, Susie Friedman of the Public Art Fund, uh, Patty Harris, Deputy uh, Mayor, uh, Mike McEwen, Deputy Governor. And uh, we asked uh, when we announced this competition for everybody to break the rules to go here, Here's the space. Go up, go out, go down. Make it sound, make it water, make it stone, make it green. Everybody will do what you need to do is to work through your grieving process and the space you want to leave behind. And sure enough, we received 13,800 registrations. And eventually, um, by August 1st, 5,201 design boards, 30 inch by 40 inch, um, uh, core <coughs> boards with axiometric designs in them. We viewed these uh, sequestered downtown a couple blocks away on the 30th floor overlooking ground zero, uh, 200 at a time. We saw every single one. Uh, we took our notes, we argued, we debated, we laughed, cried. Maybe the hardest part of all uh, during this. this. This was supposed to be a relief, but um, we had three different sessions with family members at the Tribeca Center for the Arts where we sat up on the stage. Um, we introduced ourselves, but then a microphone was passed from one family to the other, and they just uh, told the stories of their lost loved ones, what they had lost, who this person was, what they wanted to remember of this person, and our job was only to be informed by their loss. They weren't telling us what to make, but it made several of the jurors very uncomfortable when we realized that we had a hard time absorbing all that loss. We had weekly meetings with the mayor, now Mayor Bloomberg. Uh, he was very good, very generous. He was a little bit skeptical at first of the memorial process and then got on board and in fact uh, made the first uh, huge donation of personal do donation of $250 million um, to the 9-11 Memorial Foundation, and then challenged his uh, business partners to come in with the same. 
Governor Pataki is reassuring us that he won't overrule us. You can see Maya's a little worried. Michael Van Valkenburg on the left was actually the chair of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Jury that chose Maya Lin. So now there we are all in the same room with the mayor. And of course the mayor understood that by letting our decision stand <clears throat> that um, it was the best political thing to do. Um, if we chose a great design, he could get full credit for having run a great process. If we chose a bad design, we would get the blame completely and he could you know, relieve himself of that responsibility. Uh, we knew we were used politically, uh, just as I was used politically in Berlin. It's the nature of these design competitions, finding the right chemistry. The mayor surrounding himself with the jurors on the eve of the uh, Republican National Convention that came to New York in uh, 2004. Mayor Bloomberg uh, gave us Gracie Mansion uh, to use when we whittled it down to eight finalists. And here he was fantastic. <clears throat> he just turned it over to us. Um, we didn't know the names of the finalists until we chose the eight final designs. It was a blind competition. They were barcoded, every single submission. And here we met the finalists for the very first time, going over their designs, eating, drinking, a lot of wine. Most of the mayor's cellar was gone by the end of the competition. We narrowed it down to three finalists. <clears throat> uh, one, a French team proposed planting over the entire site with uh, blossom and fruit bearing trees, articulating the footprints in mille de fleurs or wildflower gardens, which we liked very much, very simple. Um, every time we came back applauding their simplicity, they came back with another fancy idea. We said no. And then they came back and said, how about we want to put a vitrine, we want to put a glass wall around the footprints and the wildflower gardens and allow only family members to go inside the gardens. And why would you want to do that? You know, and put the family members on a display as if in a museum vitrine? It made no sense. It got more and more complicated. They wanted several layers, light coming up at night, light filtering down <clears throat> uh, by day. But we loved the idea of this pastoral elegiac uh, cycle of life <clears throat> in nature, um, a very traditional memorial response, relocating death in the cycle of life. They would go dormant, they would bloom in the spring, and, uh, and the images they included were, were very compelling, but in the end, they got too complicated. The second team, number two team, was from Germany. They proposed something called the Memorial Cloud. It was spectacular. Glass tubes, almost like in a sea of glass over the top, but not, not obstructing the, um, or not including or encumbering the, the footprints here. Uh, but once again, uh, several of us had this reaction that, yes, it would complement beautifully Santiago Calatrava's design for the transit center at Fulton Street, a beautiful kind of winged glass bird about to take off. But um, this was so eye-absorbing and so much of a spectacle that there was, it, there was no place for us in it. <clears throat> um, we were absorbed by it. There was no, it didn't open up anything within us. And this was like the, the kind of the phrasing that came back over and over, especially with Maya and the Michael Van Valkenburg. So in the end, we chose this rough design by Michael Arad. Um, and here, it's important to, as he, as he came over, actually, to meet us for the very first time, he, <clears throat> brought with him a video and several drawings that he had done um, almost immediately after the attacks. So this is a Liebeskind's design uh, made about three months after we announced the winning design by Michael Rotter and Peter Walker. So within two months of the attacks, <clears throat> uh, Michael Rod had actually watched the buildings fall from the roof of his own building in the East Village. Uh, he li just lived north about a half a mile. And, um, and was devastated. Uh, he was a young architect designing uh, facades for police buildings. 
in lower Manhattan. Um, <clears throat> he got out a, a drawing board and began sketching <clears throat> and just off, just had this epiphany where he wanted to build two gigantic voids in the harbor just off of Battery Park City. Each exactly the size and, and proportion of the actual World Trade Center site footprints, almost 200 feet square, and they would be built down into the harbor. Now, logistically, he didn't know how he would do this, but visually, he wanted to see what it would look like. So this picture um, is of a water table he made on his rooftop uh, in November 2001. There's no memorial competition. Nobody's even, except for the town, talking, city's talking about the memorial. But he's got this idea. And he wanted us to know the history of his idea so we'd understand his point, what he was, what he was proposing here. And this was his design board, which passed through all those stages you know, to get to the final eight. And you see that the plaza is completely barren, but we did like these two huge voids, already called reflecting absence, two further voids in their midst, galleries underneath that would allow visitors to look up through the veils of water to see the sky and the buildings around. But we hated that it replicated the um, kind of the, the, the worst features of the super blocks of the World Trade Center towers themselves, the extremely inhospitable plazas that made people feel very small and unprotected, exposed. So we asked him to change that, add some life. So he added a few trees and so that's a start. Um, and then we invited him to uh, go out and find the very best landscape architect he could find. He didn't say who or where, it's up to you. Um, we, you need to do something with the plazas. And we were making suggestions like this to all these teams. And he found the best landscape architect he could find, the, maybe the greatest in the world. Uh, Peter Walker, who has done uh, dozens of gardens, especially in Japan, kind of minimalist gardens. And uh, Peter Walker proposed um, taking what he called an abacus grid of trees. <clears throat> They'd be in perfectly neat rows, you can see, going from east to west, west to east, so that when viewed from east to west, you would look down, like looking down the streets in New York City. The city grid is right before you. But when viewed from north-south, you would see just random arrangements of trees. So he's integrated natural random arrangements with the very systematic grid of the city in this one tree design. And we loved it. <clears throat> and we knew then that this would be the winning design. And this was their, their computer model um, at the very end. So that was what we announced in 2004, in January 2004. The trees were planted in April 2004 in a tree farm in New Jersey, white swamp oaks. Liebeskind's design has obviously morphed into something completely different. Um, he doesn't, you know, he still owns 49% of the share in his design. David Childs uh, redesigned completely for, for all kinds of other complicated reasons, including security. Um, but the shapes of these buildings really are now what you will see downtown. This is what the new skyline looks like from New Jersey. One year before the memorial opened, uh, it was the ninth anniversary. And this is where construction stood on the ninth anniversary. You can see the voids are there. Trees are beginning to be planted. <clears throat> this was right in the middle of the controversy around the um, Islamic Cultural Center that was being proposed for Park Place a few blocks north. The same families were there. You remember the very first pictures, I, we have Kathy Smith's family there remembering her then too with the same signs. The flowers, demonstrations, uh, mostly um, against those opposed to the uh, Islamic Cultural Center. And then on the 10th anniversary, President Obama came with uh, Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, uh, all the senators from New York, obviously all the mayors, and family members came uh, to dedicate the new memorial, and for the very first time to allow family members to go in and see it. Um, I had the honor of uh, leading uh, Hillary Clinton through and explaining to her how we, how we chose this, but our 
our main um, uh, purpose in choosing this memorial design is really echoed in their, their presses, in which Michael Rod and Peter Walker suggest that <clears throat> they wanted to balance loss with life, absence and regeneration, life coming back in the trees, the taller the trees grow, the deeper the volumes of the voids become, water that falls into these voids but never fills them up. I was there a few weeks ago with the Pope and the Pope got this immediately. He, he described the waterfalls are, as both endless tears and as um, unreplenished, unreplenished loss that will never be compensated. So here's, here's the Pope who understands this, this concept maybe better than anybody. The issue of how to arrange the names um, was a little fraught. Um, <clears throat> Michael Arad suggested uh, early on arranging them in what he called meaningful adjacencies in which every single family was asked who they would like their lost loved one to be located near. Um, every single family, every family responded and um, Michael Arad's architecture firm, uh, Handel Company, found an algorithm by which they could, in fact, locate every single name next to a name that they wanted and next to names that those other names wanted to be by as well, throughout the whole, all four, you know, all eight sides. The firefighters and first responders, uh, police officers and uh, rescue crews that were lost when the towers collapsed, um, are identified by ladder company numbers and by precinct office numbers. Um, so that they are remembered distinctly, but we hope not in, not in a hierarchy, just to make sure that we remember that they lost their lives doing uh, their civic good, trying to save people. So maybe we'll have to leave it to the visitors to decide whether or not they find this just to be another Holocaust memorial or whether, in fact, we can see that arc of memorial forms connecting World War I to World War II and the Holocaust, <clears throat> even to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial and finally to the 9-11 Memorial and beyond. Um, this preoccupation with voids we find in all, all these different media, um, this preoccupation with absence and lo loss that cannot be ever you know, compensated. So with that, I uh, will end and I'll take some questions. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, so any questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Oh, your voice is pretty good, though. Thank you for a wonderful lecture. A number of years ago, my husband and I were in Warsaw, and we went to look for my grandparents' grave in the Jewish cemetery. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, they had died before the Holocaust. Um, and in the process of hunting, we came across a memorial of six white marble pillars the size that human beings could be. Mm -hmm. And it was very moving for mm. both of us and for me because I had lost so many family members. Right. What I'd like to know, is there any record of these more personal, private memorials that must exist all over Europe? That's my question. They are all over Europe, and they're kind of the, the, the family-made memorials, or what we might call the vernacular memorials, or spontaneous memorials, um, do form a network for those who know all about them, and often will go from one to the other. They often be, end up being very community-based. I mean, Warsaw has all kinds of different memorials, um, according to the, including the Umschlagplatz you know, memorial design, and 
And of course, the Warsaw Ghetto Memorial by Nathan Rappaport, <clears throat> and um, small plaques everywhere. The Jewish, or the Jewish cemetery was mostly destroyed uh, during the war by the Nazis. Um, tombstones broken up and ground up into dust. But local uh, Polish Catholic volunteers after the war, you know, uh, turned some of these um, fragmented tombstones into retaining walls, you know, an attempt to kind of mend memory, uh, which created its own uh, memorial medium in a way. You know, the, the, the breaches and the cracks, you know, suggesting that these things can't really be put back together again. Um, but here's the attempt, you know, to, you know, to remember those who were lost. Um, during the uh, time I was curating this Jewish Museum exhibition, um, early on, 92, 93, I was looking for memorials in the uh, then Soviet Union and now, uh, now Russia. <clears throat> and I was directed uh, by the uh, photo archivist at Yad Vashem to a huge archive of photographs which had been deposited there by Russian immigrants, Jewish immigrants, who came and they didn't know what to do with them. But the, these were all, there were hundreds of photographs of them standing at little family-made memorials throughout what would have been the Soviet Union. These were forbidden memorials. Uh, as soon as the authorities, uh, Soviet authorities found them, they tore them down, they buried them. But every year, the families would come and put them back, whether it be a, a little mug and David made of sticks in a tree, um, a mug and David made out of stones on the ground. And the photographs were very touching because they'd all be standing there in kind of their, you know, their Sunday best, all looking down at this, this little memorial. Most of them recorded now only by photographs. And maybe you even took photographs of the pillars there. Um, which neighborhood was it where you found these six pillars? Do you remember? I didn't understand the question. Which, which neighborhood? I'm sorry, I don't remember. Yeah. Okay. I think it was very close to the entrance of the cemetery. Not far from the wall that you mentioned of the pieces of the mm -hmm. tombstones. Okay. They were very prominent. And of course, this, have any of you been to the Warsaw Cemetery? It's not like any cemetery you've ever seen. The bodies are buried one on top of one another. Right. Uh, there are multiple tombstones on top of one another. Very crowded. So yeah. it's hard to find anything there. Right. But I, I remember the pillars being near the front, Selma. Okay. Couple questions up here in the front. It's just an observation. Um, you know, it's a centuries-long tradition to have memorials to the lost. People lost at sea. People died in war. Most of those memorial. Uh, that's a, a very long tradition. But what I find so striking is that the monuments we've been talking about in this lecture have been created a new kind of iconography of vacu va vacuums in a way. Mm -hmm. And there seems to me just such a resistance to making anything concrete, figurative, or you know, a concrete symbolic uh, entity. You know, even a Jewish star that kind of melts away as you move away. Right. Um, and I didn't know whether you wanted to comment on sure. this resistance to. Well, it comes from several places. In the case of the younger German artists and architects, <clears throat> um, there's a, a fierce resistance to commemorating um, the murdered Jews of Europe in any kind of form that might seem to redeem the mass murder. That is, redeem it with beauty, um, uh, with consolation. They said that that kind of consolation and beauty is illegitimate. We can't do anything that you know, puts a, um, a silver lining on this mass murder. We must remember absence with absence. We must remember destruction with destruction. And that's very different from what we would have done in New York, where we have every right, in fact, to find some kind of compensation in these losses. The victims' families were compensated by a victims' compensation fund, you know, after all. The city did need to rebuild itself, but do so in a way that would remember destruction that is loss and regeneration at the same time. Um, but in Berlin in particular, and especially for this generation of artists, um, is the breaches and the voids 
um, that must be remembered, um, and, and the lives lost, who these people were, who the individuals were, you know, what their lives were like, and to get away from kind of the emblems of destruction alone. And it was really the emblems of destruction, you know, the barbed wire and chimneys and you know, gas chambers. That, that was kind of the iconography immediately after the war you know, of, you know, of mass murder. And uh, it took a little bit of time, but you know, the culture moved away from that to remembering a thousand years of Jewish civilization you know, wiped out. And that was important. It's also the time, you know, abstraction is not just a post-World War II phenomenon. You know, it really began after World War I. There was a, this a huge movement away from pure representation and pure figuration. Um, Samantha can pick this up much better than I can. But um, that uh, post-war generation of, for example, deconstructivist architects who didn't want architectural design to suggest that um, they're the universe is a completely rational, civilized place. It's, a, it's something that should be destabilized. Um, uh, after the Holocaust, in, in their minds, no more corners that you know, give us like reassuring you know, corners you know, and, and fixed walls. We need to be disoriented a little bit. We need to be off balance a little bit. And hence the, you know, the kind of the, the wavy designs and the, and the, the, the tilted ground level you know, that kind of make you a little bit seasick even when you walk through some of these. That's, that's going to change. I mean, there's, there's no single answer and, and there's no single moment that probably best represents um, you know, a whole generation's response. Architecture is really divided between those who embrace Liebeskind and, and um, Eisenman and those who just hate them you know, and, and hate their work you know, for, what they, for what they suggest. And that's, that's normal. Uh, abstraction, um, you know, abstraction for memorials is, is a kind of tricky. You know, Nathan Rappaport once said, well, I could have made, uh, you know, a rock with a hole in it and said, voila, the, you know, the martyrdom of the Jews. But I didn't. I made instead a very figurative statuary in the Warsaw Ghetto Monument, you know, with, with real faces. And of course, they're kind of proletariat figures. And so the critics went after him for that. Um, but he was not trained. He was trained in the Beaux-Arts tradition of figures. Uh, Lipschitz would have made something completely different, even though the, you know, they, were, they were friends. Maya Lin was trained in the 70s and 80s you know, as, an, as an architect, and her preoccupation was with um, kind of a, you know, recreating a little bit of the violence in order to articulate the terrible ambivalence that most Americans in 1980 still felt about the Vietnam War and about the vets, for better or worse. You know, there is a memorial that kind of complements the Vietnam War Memorial very nicely, and I'm not talking about the three figures of soldiers, but the Korean War Memorial, just, just really about 50 meters away, is actually a flying wedge, a platoon of uh, life-sized life uh, soldiers in their rain slickers, you know, uh, with their backpacks and their weapons going forward in that flying wedge you know, formation, military formation. So in a way, that positive military formation would actually fill the space that she created in her triangle, you know, in, that, in that empty space, the negative form space. So I see kind of a nice compliment there. And I also believe that you know, none of these things should ever only be one thing. You know, they all come together, and together there's a composite of these memorial responses um, over time. What's your take on Gudrun Demning's uh, stumbling stones, the Stilpelsteine? Oh, yeah, I, I love them. Yeah, I, I think they're great. Uh, I love that he did them very quietly in the beginning. You know, they were picked up on, and now you, there's a database where you can go and find all of them you know, if you want to search them out in the city. Um, Jay's referring to uh, a German artist <coughs> who uh, began researching the homes of uh, murdered Jews in Germany uh, to begin with. And then he would, uh, without any fanfare, create kind of a, 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 a brass cobblestone inscribed with the names of the family members, when they were born, where they lived, and where they were murdered. Auschwitz, Tedezin, where, wherever it was. And then he would replace one of the little cobblestones in front of the house with this brass thing, a uh, brass cobblestone just slightly elevated to become a you know, Stolperstein, a, a stumbling stone, you know, quite literally, so that you'd be walking along and trip over the memory of whoever once, of the Jews who once lived in that particular house. 
And now they're really all over Europe. If you go any German city, I, I think there must be, I think there are 20,000 of them now. Yeah. But not in Munich. Munich doesn't allow it? Yeah. That doesn't surprise me for some reason. I just wanted to say that when we were in Berlin, you know, I was very touched with the specific stones that were kind of slabs sticking out near the Bundestag, which represented the former Jewish members of, mm -hmm. of the Bundestag. I thought that was very effective. But I was pretty horrified by that uh, thing in the middle of, uh, close by, you know, with all the slabs. It's so mm -hmm. huge. I wonder what it must be like living in an apartment overlooking that. Mostly, not, not too many apartments there, um, but there's a very good view from China House, kind of on the, on the north side. Um, Eisenman wanted to build something that couldn't be photographed, but of course it's photographed. He didn't want it fixed. He wanted something that would remain alive. But you're right, the scale is um, itself bombastic, uh, depending, it was 5,000 square meters. And, um, the scale of the World Trade Center site memorial, I mean the 9-11 memorial, is also, I, f I feel and fear, um, uh, too big. This, the scale is, is, is un inhumanely you know, large. But this is due to it trying to be equivalent to what was lost. And what was lost were buildings exactly in that, in that footprint, 200 feet square. Um, so it was really the monumentality of the buildings has uh, led now to, I think, kind of a monumentality of these, of these voids. They are too big. There was a question back here on the gentleman on the left here. Just to expand a little bit outside the Holocaust issues, uh, would you want to comment on the monument at the Murnau building in Oklahoma City? Oh, <clears throat> yeah, it was um, <clears throat> an unusually fast process. Um, the victims' families really demanded um, kind of not, not instantaneous mourning space, but they didn't want it to drag out, <clears throat> uh, reflecting a you know, particular culture uh, in that city a devastating loss, no real vocabulary for remembering a domestic act of terror like this. Um, it's interesting that the form that took the empty, empty chairs uh, would bespeak absence or loss. Um, the empty chair is, um, is in fact a, kind of a, an icon that, that goes back um, to the early 20th century. There was even a memorial in East Berlin uh, before the wall came down of a, a, a table with two empty chairs, one chair tipped over and the other chair still standing in, in a little courtyard. So this idea of absence is represented here was interesting. I think it's unusual as a process for how fast they did it. And uh, I think they had it done within two, two years, which is kind of, kind of phenomenal on the one hand, but on the other hand, um, did they give it the time they needed and I guess the answer is they gave it the time it took. And in New York, some people said, well, 10 years is too fast. And some say, 10 years is too slow. 10 years is the time it took you know, to do it. And there's, there's no prescription, I think, for time. Just take the time you need it, but don't, don't close yourself off. Don't give yourself this box of time or space or, or form. We have to work it through so that these solutions are not foreclosed, I think. Um, going back to the National Mall, could you please comment on the World War II Memorial? Oh, you really want me to? Yeah. Oh, okay. The, I, I think yeah. you just did. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Everybody obviously needs and we even demand a World War II Memorial, but that's, that's an example of a process that got so politicized that if you didn't like that particular design, you were you know, accused of not wanting a memorial at all. But there was this, the crush of time. Um, Tom Hanks and the, you know, the, the people kind of organizing this knew that the vets you know, were, were dying away. 
and they really wanted to get this in place before that generation was gone. The greatest generation demanded the greatest memorial, and they, and they demanded it now. And that part's understandable, but the particular design that won, um, I think is uh, really unfortunate. You know, it's um, not, not just conventional, but almost a parody of conventional, you know, uh, you know, classic um, kind of 30s kind of this real brutalist architecture, and worse, it, it bisects them all. So I, for that, I think I, I can't really forgive it. But people go to it, and the vets go to it, and the vets' children and grandchildren will go there. Um, but systematically, I don't see that it makes a lot of memorial sense in breaking it into states and everything else it does. So. I'm afraid that was the result of a, a real rush you know, to memorialize before that generation was gone. I just was wondering if you were involved with the memorial in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. I did consult on it um, a little bit, and some of the processes were coordinated, you know, the memorial downtown. But each one had its own dedicated process, as did the one, the Pentagon Memorial <clears throat> um, had its own process. It was run by the Pentagon and really reflected kind of the culture of the Pentagon in a really interesting way. So they leave in, in, in Washington. Um, there's almost no sign that this ever happened except for the memorial, but they did leave a, a, um, a different colored stone to show the point of impact. But the point of the Pentagon is to defend it was designed to defend against attack, and it was also def to def defined to defend against memory of an attack in this way, the way that the buildings are designed. So the memorial itself was, uh, there is a result, and the memorial itself are these little benches you know, with the names of the victims underneath and kind of a garden. Um, they're, they're kind of, um, they're shaped kind of like, like this on the ground, and, and you can sit there and remember, and, and I, I think it, it works you know, pretty well, and that was also a pretty fast process. The Shanksville process is still fraught, um, although it's a it's little bit less so, but they've now proposed a pretty big documentation center for it, um, so that, that process is getting drawn out. Um, Ed Linenthal, <clears throat> who wrote a great book about both the, called Unfinished Bombing about the Oklahoma Memorial, and wrote also about the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, uh, was invited to consult with them in Shanksville as I was, but I was already working in, DC, in, in New York City. So he went to Shanksville and worked with them. Uh, and I think he's writing that up now. So that'll be interesting. I was curious about the memorial I know, where's the image? Yeah, the image is in um, <clears throat> my new book. Um, all, the, all the pictures I show are, are ones that I, I take. And um, the pictures I took there, I took as a backpacker in 1976, and they don't show anything. So we're actually going back. Um, uh, in November, we're going to visit my a son who's studying for the semester in Europe, and we're gonna visit Normandy and the Battle of the Sun Memorial. And I'm gonna bring my good camera with me this time. But basically, it's a, the, 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 it's a huge brick design on the one hand, but on the, the other, there's a, a, a black triangular wall, um, and they have all the names of the soldiers who fell in the Battle of the Sub inscribed into this wall. So Maya Lin took those names with her away. Um, but there's also a sense that the black marble foundation for this thing is also inspiring um, in, in some sense, and she took that away as well. When you uh, showed the photograph of the Berlin Monument, you said it would be like looking out on the field, seeing the rise and the fall of the mm -hmm. land. And I was thinking about uh, Ukraine. When Jews were killed, they were put into mass graves, they were shot, and oftentimes they didn't die immediately, and so the land was always moving. And this kind of reminded me what a metaphor. Sure. I'm sure the architects weren't thinking of that, knowing what happened in Ukraine. But uh, that's the image that I have. Well, no, it's, uh, I think it's a legitimate association. Um, uh, some people would look at it <clears throat> as uh, you know, moving in the wind, but in fact, the topography is so irregular like that. And there was that pitching and turning of the, of the mass graves in Ukraine. And um, so it's, it's, it's there. Eisenman would say yes, and you know, 
bring all your associations to this, and this too is part of the memorial, you would say. I, <clears throat> excuse me. I just came back from a World Federation of Child Survivors Conference, and one of the subjects that was discussed is that in Auschwitz, they have all these things, like they have hundreds and thousands of suitcases and shoes and hair and glasses, um, and they're being, I mean, they're disintegrating. What, who should take care of them, and how should they take care of them? And what can be there instead of mm -hmm. those items? Well, they, they will eventually disintegrate. I mean, not all of them, the glasses, the prosthetic limbs, and the uh, shaving brushes. And uh, they were collected <clears throat> from uh, what they called Canada, these gigantic storage um, barracks uh, at Auschwitz. And, and when the museum was first made, they wanted to collect them as evidence of mass murder. But they were doing it in kind of a, a, a communist you know, context that basically these were factories of death that produced only the artifacts of the victims. So at Majdanek, for example, um, uh, right, in Lublin, uh, the Soviet Red Army liberated Majdanek in July 1944, um, and by October 1944 had already created a museum at Majdanek, very close to what I saw when I went there the first time in 1976. And it was composed also of shoes, um, hats, uh, thousands and thousands of the uniforms. And, um, and of course, by 1976 at Majdanek, there was also that gigantic memorial by Victor Tolkien um, with a path leading down to the crematorium, which was still standing, and a gigantic urn with the ashes, uh, several tons of human ash, which was brought out from the crematorium and put there and covered by this, this weird do dome. The aim was to uh, provide evidence, but the evidence was now used to explain whatever interpretation the authorities attached to the site. And so until 1989, uh, this was a site, for example, at Auschwitz, where it said on this site between the years 1940 and 1945, uh, four million people suffered and died here at the hands of the Nazi murderers. And it's just not true. You know, at Auschwitz, about 1.2 million people, mostly Jews, 1.1 million Jews, you know, were killed there. But by inflating that number, the kind of the, the, the Soviet-controlled uh, you know, museum uh, diminished the proportion of Jews killed and exaggerated the proportion of political prisoners there and Soviet POWs you know, killed there. So it was a purely political number. And that, all those objects were being used to tell that story. I'm not, uh, I, I understand why museums will do that, and they're now working on how to preserve these, but there's probably going to be a time when these objects <coughs> um, go away. And um, uh, some will disappear. You know, when the US Holocaust Memorial Museum opened, they wanted very much to go borrow these objects from, from Auschwitz. And I, I was already advising them, and, and I asked them not to. I said, <clears throat> um, don't remember the victims only by their remains, by these artifacts. Remember them by the lives they lived, you know, by their education, their, um, <clears throat> their communities, um, by their culture. Um, but you know, remembering them only by the shoes or prosthetic limbs is really remembering them as the Nazis left them to us. And um, I, so I think there needs to be a balance somewhere between kind of privileging artifacts over the stories and interpretations and showing the artifacts as evidence, you know, for what happened. So it's, it's still a bit of an open question. So I, I want to thank Professor Young for a really fantastic presentation. And hopefully we will find a way to bring you back to Cleveland. Maybe we'll have some of your books on hand next time.